go. I can see again. Okay, um, so it's uh, nice to see you all again. Uh, um, thank you for coming to listen. Um, so today I'll be sharing some uh, joint work uh, with these charming people, um, Raul and Christian, who are both uh, in the audience. Um, so this is some ongoing work. Uh, we've posted um, this first part uh, to the archive. Uh, and if you're interested, of course, you're welcome to take a look. <clears throat> so uh, the plan today is uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the rough Bergamia model. Uh, here's maybe the mildest mathematical statement that I can make, but it's a little bit of a, an in-joke, right? So the weak rate uh, that I'll show you for uh, the Euler scheme for um, simplified version of the rough Bergami model uh, we find is h plus one half, um, unless it isn't, and uh, there'll be more about this in a moment. It's not that I'm waffling about the rate that we've found, uh, it's that you have some special cases, right, where um, one, one can prove that it's a bit better. Um, and uh, then I'll, I'll sort of uh, sketch the proof uh, for you. Uh, we use very uh, low tech tools here. Um, so we, 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 we look on a sort of Markovian extended state space and then use Taylor expansions and some uh, conditioning uh, arguments uh, to get the rate. So if you came hoping to see uh, all sorts of very beautiful advanced mathematics, and I'm afraid I don't have that for you, I just have Taylor expansions, which is nice in a way. Um, so uh, let's let's jump ahead, right? Rough Bergami model. Um, so I, I suppose a, a lot of you are probably uh, much better versed in uh, this model uh, than I am. I saw Yasir and uh, Jaheb are in the audience. They've been thinking about this uh, model uh, for probably longer than I have. Um, I'm Christian. Uh, so the evidence, right, suggests that uh, volatility is rough. <clears throat> so uh, rough stochastic volatility rate is an increasingly popular uh, paradigm in quantitative finance um, because it addresses sort of two uh, empirical challenges. So right, empirical evidence based on uh, the realized volatility uh, suggests that volatility is rough. Right? And this is actually sort of the paper of this um, work by uh, Jim Gatherall. Um, which first appeared in 2014, but it didn't get published until 2018. Um, in fact, Jim has recently won some very nice award from the Quant of the Year um, from, from a journal. Um, so uh, the two challenges that these rough stochastic volatility models are meant to address is that the, the time series um, indicate that the log realized variance uh, has a holder regularity um, that's less than a half um, as well, right? It's that you um, recover the, the power law explosion of uh, at the money applied volatility as skew. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a power law um, as, as, as the time to maturity goes to zero. Um, and the sort of the short, uh, the short sort of takeaway, right, is that the sort of the log realized variance behaves more like a fractional Brownian motion um, with a with a very small um, Hurst index, uh, typically of order say 0.1. I think I've seen 0.07 in some other papers, um, and um, right, how should we model that? Well. Um, for rough stochastic volatility models, right? We, we consider here um, uh, a volatility model for an asset price S of T, right? Where Z here is just a, a standard Brownian motion. And there's, uh, to my understanding, two, two broad classes of, uh, of, of rough stochastic volatility models, depending on how you want to model this instantaneous uh, variance component. Um, so one class of model um, is these, these so-called uh, rough Heston models, uh, where the 
uh, instantaneous uh, variance here component is, is modeled. Uh, it solves a Volterra SDE with some power law kernel. Okay, um, and here's some some works where you can look look on that if you're interested. Uh, the model that instead I'm going to be talking about today um, is the rough Bergami model. So uh, this is where we have sort of an explicit function of the fractional Brownian motion um, to model our instantaneous variance component. Um, so you see here this fractional Brownian motion, right, is a, a Riemann-Louisville fractional Brownian motion. So it's, it's a fractional Brownian motion that's defined by integrating um, a kernel like this, yeah, um, with respect to dW. Um, and right, this Brownian motion here is, is correlated uh, with the Z. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, this causes some trouble, right? Um, both for theory and pneumatic, numerics, right? Because, I mean, these, these rough stochastic volatility models, right, we no longer have a uh, Markov property here for our processes. And uh, typically, uh, right, I mean, you, one also needs um, simulation-based methods. Um, we don't have uh, analytic solutions. So um, what, what can one do? <clears throat> So, uh, right, for this rough Bergamo model, right, I said we had this uh, uh, integral of a fractional Brownian motion and uh, more or less, right, what we're trying to do is we're, we're interested in approximating uh, stochastic integrals of this form, right, where, you know, psi is some nice deterministic function um, so that this, um, and, and here we have our riemann louisville fraction Brownian motion. Uh, the, these integrals are, exist, right, in, in a classic Ito sense. So the integrand is adapted and square integrable under appropriate conditions. Um, so if, for example, we're, we consider a left point uh, rule, right, this, you know, this convergence, right, uh, is, is classical. Now, the rate of convergence, okay, um, for, I mean, th th this, is, this is known um, to be rate H. I hesitate mildly because here, um, Leinkirch and Schalko, they, I believe they use not the Riemann-Louisville fractional Brownian motion, but instead um, sort of the standard fractional Brownian motion. Uh, but nevertheless, right, uh, we believe that the strong rate is H. Um, which is some, Sorry, some trouble, Eric. right? I mean, yes? Can I ask you, is there a relationship between those two Ws, the WH and the other W? Right, yes. Um, so here we, we would integrate and it would be, um, so I mean, this, this definition here, I, I would use the same W. Okay, thank so you. So this would be, yeah, no worries. And if anyone else has questions, you can interrupt. It's okay, I don't mind. Um, okay, uh, so, so the strong rate is H. Now, um, of course, right, if we've already said that, you know, empirically we see that the H is tiny uh, and the strong rate is H, then, you know, supposing that you need, you know, N time steps, right, to reach some uh, error tolerance. Uh, then decrease uh, to decrease by you know a factor of ten to get the next significant digit right requires far too many uh, time steps right uh, increase in the asymptotic regime. Um, fortunately, right, we're interested in uh, weak convergence typically, right? So we we imagine that we have some payoff function uh, phi, uh, and we're interested in some expected value of a functional uh, phi of the underlying. Um, so if we imagine, right, for, for some Euler scheme for standard SDEs, right, when we're, we're thinking of the driving noise being a, a Brownian motion, right, which would correspond to having a Hurst index of, of one half, then, then we would expect weak rate one uh, and strong rate one half. 
and right, that's what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the you know the viability of these numerical methods for option pricing clearly then depend on on, on the rate, right? So we, we very much hope that the weak rate <laughs> is not so bad as as the strong rate, um, and uh, right in particular. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, this is not all doom and gloom, right? Because, uh, you know, discretization based, me based methods have uh, been very successfully used uh, in the literature, right? I mean, I, you know, Jaheb, so sorry. Dr. Ben Hamuda, right, um, has observed rate uh, one, and, and in fact, it was stable enough uh, to extrapolate. Um, so they did some some Richardson extrapolation. Um, so, uh, what is our contribution uh, that I'd like to share with you uh, today? Um, so it's it's right, it's that we can give a weak rate um, for these sorts of problems. And in particular, right, if we're interested in um, a, a approximating uh, integrals like this with a left point approximation, so essentially, right, uh, an Euler uh, type scheme, th then, right, this uh, converges with weak rate h plus one half when we think uh, not here about psi, but just taking uh, the identity function. If we replace the payoff uh, with not just any general payoff, but a payoff that is quadratic, um, then we observe weak rate one. So uh, this is uh, right. I mean, why I say the weak rate is H plus one half, unless it isn't. Um, so a, a few remarks, as I said, this is uh, ongoing work. Um, so we're, we are working um, to give a complete proof, right, for the general case where we have nonlinear psi, which would put us, um, you know, I mean, you, you noticed for this uh, introduction that I gave, this fast introduction to the week, uh, this rough Bergami problem that, you know, you had some functional, I mean, nice uh, deterministic, but still uh, it wasn't linear. Um, so really to solve the problem, we need to consider this uh, general case. Um, but the, the, the first remark that I wanna make right is that the problem is subtle, right? Uh, we have obtained rate one for quadratic payoffs. Um, and we have numerical evidence that suggests, right? Functions that are well approximated by quadratic polynomials as seen from the law of the solution, right, may be hard to distinguish from rate one empirically. It makes it very tricky, right? Um, and in general, right, the H is suggested to be very small, which makes things difficult. Um, we, we do not have a lower bound, um, establishing that the weak rate cannot be better than H plus one half in general, uh, but uh, we, we do have some numerical evidence which leads us very strongly. I mean, it's very, very much consistent with H plus one half. So um, we're quite happy, uh, I think, or at least I am. I don't know how happy Christian is. Uh, probably he's happy. He's a positive person. Right. So you want uh, to, so... comment, to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy, Christian? <laughs> very happy. <laughs> ah, good. See, it's, it's great. <laughs> Eric, can Thank I you. Ask you a sure, sure. If you, if you go back to the previous two slides, um, yeah, this? yes, yeah. So yeah. the phi is the payoff, and the payoff is if it's quadratic, are you then approximating the expected value of WTH squared? Uh, you... No, because it's a, an integral, right? It's, it's this the guy, right? So it's phi of, of this integral. So it's the integral that. Okay, so um, this the, is, the, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. This is what you called ST before. Yes, yes. In fact, I'll give it a different name. I'll call it X because it, it seems a little cheating, right? I mean, because it's, you know, it's 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 a little bit of a of a simpler model problem, and this caused enough of a headache. <laughs> So um, the, the only thing that, I mean, it's, it's sort of, I, I find it really interesting because I mean, this isn't the case, right? When you, when you think about, you know, the weak rate of convergence uh, for, for you know, these other 
other sorts of models, I don't think it's typically the case that you say, ah, oh, for this specific class of payoffs, you see a different rate. So that's that's a little that's a little funny. Um, I think. Mm. Have, you, have you tried numerically um, when the payoff is, is cubic instead of quadratic, and you observe less than one? Or oh, you ask you ask the good questions. Just wait. I, I okay, sorry. Got a zinger, zinger for you. <laughs> so may I uh, we, may I make a personal yeah. comment? Uh, yes, please. I I found this an interesting question also because. It is not so clear to me what the relationship between the strong rate one half and the weak rate one is in the general diffusive regular h equals one half case. There are various different possibilities, right? One is two times one half, or it is one half plus one half, or it is just one. So and of course, if you replace one half by h, this leads to different possible like conjectures. In particular, the one which we see from the quadratic payoff and the one half plus h would give exactly the same result for h equals one half, obviously. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, no it I, is. I, I can, I I can have another one just. Just that uh, yeah. Christian had one, so let me add another one. Uh, you were saying that uh, it is not so common that uh, if you change the payoff, the, the rate will change. Well, the common thing is that you change the class regularity of the payoff, and maybe in some cases, or, or the coefficients, and in some cases, you you can get uh, different rates. But in this case, you compare, like you was, you're going to do two polynomials, right? One grade three, one grade, yes. grade two, and some yeah, other yeah. things uh, change, right? Yeah, 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 yes, that that is that is true. So let's let's and I, I give these sorts of things up at the front. So um, okay, so so just to push on. Um, so here, I mean, you, you'll allow me. I hope, uh, right? I, I give a little bit more detail, right? So we say, I mean, this is the general finding, right? Is that our weak rate is h plus one half. Um, and we're considering here, right, this left point scheme. Um, so, I mean, if, if the problem were not trivialized to this stochastic integral, then this would correspond to, you know, an euler mariam approximation. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, th this is sort of, I mean, this is it, right? Um, and, and so, uh, Right, so, so I mean, before we look at sort of the spirit of the proof, um, I have some nice uh, numerical experiments, a very simple calm. Um, the first thing to notice, so, so this is um, the different colors here, the green corresponds to a cubic, right? Here, the blue corresponds to, right, a heavy side, a step function. Um, which doesn't even really fit into that uh, theorem that I gave you, but nevertheless, we, we do it anyway, uh, like the cowboys uh, that we are. Um, and the, the thing to take from here, right, is that, right, as I increase on the left, uh, h is 0 0.05, and then on the right, h is 0 0.15, um, you see that the rate increases, okay? And it looks to me very much, uh, I mean, so this is just, I mean, this is based on uh, three times uh, 10 to the six uh, samples. And we have some confidence intervals given here um, around the slope, which is what these signify. And it, it looks very safe to say that the rates are not one. Okay, they're not H, they're not one. Uh, whether they're H plus a half, this, uh, Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not, um, but but I, I I think right very importantly it it looks like that I mean this is very consistent with at least the rate being dependent on h in some way right you might maybe if you don't like h plus a half you have some other idea in mind uh, okay but it, it it is some function the rate is some function of h. And it is not as horrible as H itself. Um, so, 
Can I jump in? Uh, yes. Just um, unless you can tell me that you talk about this bit later, but have you tried even powers of X then? Yes, we, we tried many and I have, like I said, I have for you coming. It's, you'll see it. It's a plot. It's purple. I think you'll like it. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, the rate uh, depends on the payoff. So, so here in the red now, I've given you um, when I take the payoff to be a quadratic function, just x squared, I get rate one. Uh -huh. Doesn't doesn't happen for x to the fourth, Abdul. I didn't draw that picture for you. Um, and and here, just on the right, right. This is what you'd expect in the typical case. Uh, when I say typical case, I mean when you have just the Brownian motion driver. Um, whether we have a quadratic or not, we still get a uh, rate one, more or less, um, when h is equal to a half. Um, so here, when we have the quadratic, right, even if h is very small, 0 0.05 or 0 0.15, we still see uh, what looks like rate one. Um, and now, uh, what happens, right? I mean, this is the sort of the surprising finding I was saying that, you know, you change to some particular payoff and you see rate one. Uh, the sort of nice thing is hopefully uh, with what I can share of the proof, um, you'll be able to sort of readily see, uh, for, 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 I mean, I said we use these asymptotic expansions and conditioning, right? So hopefully in the asymptotic expansions, you'll be able to explain this sort of behavior. And I think it, it, it is pretty clear. Um, and here's the, the nice plot for Abdul. Here I look on a shifted cubic, um, which is consistent as well with rate one. So it's not like I have some funny bug in my code, right? It's, it's also consistent with rate one. Um, and right, this we picked uh, because we sort of suspected that you know, this is better approximated, right, uh, by a quadratic in the support of the distribution of the underlying than the x cubed is. And so, right, I mean, this, 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 you know, this is, is, is much better rate. If you want to compare it here on the left, right, this is our shifted cubic. If you want to compare it to the cubic for the same uh, Hurst index sizes here, it's when h is 0 0.05, much better rate than when we just have the cubic and the same thing here. So, uh, I mean, this I, I hope, right, drives home the point that this is a really subtle problem. And if you do things, you smooth in any sort of little way, maybe you get something much better. Um, but I think it's also quite optimistic, right? So, I mean, in the sense that, right, efficient numerical methods can be obtained for a wide array of, of real world problems uh, where one hopes, right, that the effective rate of convergence is not as bad even as the theoretical rate. Um, so hopefully, you know, you, you, you're doing some experiments, you see that the rate is quite stable and it's near one, uh, I think, Go ahead and extrapolate. Um, so, sort of the second right thing uh, just to um, off right is, yeah, sure. Um, so about okay. the previous slide. Yeah, this is depends uh, on some previous experience, but in your like cases, did you consider like other many options, or also like you have consistent observations? I mean, for for different monies. So. so so again, uh, I mean, I, I have here the very simple sort of baby problem where I am just trying to integrate a uh, functional of the fractional brown emotion. Um, and I mean, these payoffs, right? I mean, these are not, I mean, this is it, right? I mean, it's not like some real payoff here. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's a toy sort of problem meant to to illustrate the point and to try and understand a little bit what's going on. Um, uh, for instance, which for the is heavy probably, side, yeah. Uh, for the heavy side, for instance, I mean, um, so, 
something digital that... option esque, but not a digital option. Okay. Uh, I mean, so that that was chosen, right? Um, simply to see. I mean, that doesn't even really fit with the um, the theorem that I gave you, right? Um, but we did it nonetheless, uh, just to see, just to see what would happen. Um, so, I mean, probably this is a bit too much. I don't know. Um, but it's, uh, it was good enough. I think, um, hope, hope that it is not too, too un, unsatisfying to you to <laughs> um, no, no, I'm, I'm just curious because we observed some, yeah. I mean, so at least, okay, numerically, but not on theoretical side that, uh, in real application, somehow this could be maybe dependent on the monist regime, but okay, we are not sure, ah. yet, but. So that's why I, see, I, was, I, I was curious to, to know, I mean, at least numerically, did you observe, I mean, if you apply this thing to real cases that this depends also on the minus or not? No, no, we've I've not applied it to any real, real cases, right? Uh, just, just integrating this and not even this when the size is the identity function. Um, so, so but right. To just, to, 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 but sure. I think you, you, you gave a partial answer with the shifted cubic that things could change very ah. much depending on where you, I mean, I agree, of course, as you say, this, these are not real options. But, uh, still. Yeah. 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 That, that's, that's a good point, uh, Christian. Um, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I think the first thing to do, right. Will, will be to, to try and get this, uh, to be some, I mean, to be more general than the identity function, right? I mean, right now we take this uh, to always be um, a linear function basically, uh, but we know that it's not, right? We saw in the motivation, right? That we should have, you know, some exponential, for example. Um, so the first order of business is, is to try try first to prove things when this is, is a nonlinear function. But right, just to recap, right? So we get this also the second, right? So the weak rate is h plus a half, unless uh, the payoff is quadratic, then we see weak rate one. And um, in fact, when we look on the proof, um, we'll see, I, I hope it'll be convincing to you, right? Why that's the case. And when we look at our Taylor expansions, um, when we have a, a payoff that is uh, quadratic, uh, the Taylor expansions involve some derivatives. And if it's, if it's only a quadratic polynomial, then some higher order terms in the expansion uh, get killed. Uh, and, and then you, you only see uh, rate delta t. Okay. Um, so then let's motivate a little bit uh, where this comes from. As I said, right, what we're thinking here, um, to sketch the proof, right? Uh, the main tools are looking at some extended uh, state space, which is Markovian, uh, and then using Taylor expansions and conditioning. Okay. So uh, a roadmap, right, is that, you know, so the main idea is so that, right, we can, present uh, our fractional Brownian motion um, with, with the, the so-called affine representation. This is uh, known classically, right? Um, we use an approximate affine representation to establish this Markovian extended state space. Um, we, we write, you know, once we have this, our discretization error is a telescoping sequence in the value function. Um, using uh, the Kolmogorov backward equation, as one would, uh, and then you obtain rates uh, by Taylor expanding and taking uh, conditional expectations, where since we sort of know a lot about these processes in our extended state space, we can make actual computations. Uh, and what I think is very nice, I mean, so it's not flashy, we're not using Malleven calculus or anything like this, uh, but I think it's very nice because you can actually sort of see the mechanism by which one would say, okay, I expect that quadratics might have uh, rate one for this for this process. 
And while it might seem a little funny in, in finance to be thinking about this sort of Markovian extended state space, I, I think in general for non-Markovian systems um, like the generalized Langevin equation uh, and other non-Markovian stochastic dynamical systems, right? This is a, a basic tool that's that's used to facilitate right analysis and computation. So um, it's it's not so left field. Okay, um, so what do I mean when I say the fraction of Brownian motion represents uh, an affine representation? Well, I mean that we can express this uh, fractional Brownian motion as an as a, as a a linear functional right to, of this infinite uh, dimensional family of, of OU processes, right? So these are Unstein Uhlenbeck processes um, that have some speed of, of mean reversion. Um, should actually be, I guess, here theta p, because here it's theta p. Um, and importantly, here the p is, is bigger than two. Um, so as I said, when, when h is less than a half, right, this is, is classical. Um, the how does one get this right? You, you take the kernel from the fractional Brownian motion, this Riemann Louisville representation. Uh, you take the Laplace transform, use stochastic Fabini, um, and then the, the extra thing that we did was we sort of changed uh, a little bit the, the variables, right? So we did a change of variables uh, just because we wanted to make this. Uh, representation slightly more amenable to quadrature because uh, the idea is that right here we have this here's a sample of our yt process right um, in this direction is time but in this direction is the theta right so uh, for this sample right it's, it's not so unbelievable right that this y of t, right, even for small h, here it's h.07, that this y of t is a smooth analytic function of, of theta. So the idea here is that we want to replace the integral um, in theta with a quadrature rule in the parameter theta. And you know, by truncating this, right, to allow us to project this fractional by motion onto this finite Markovian state space. Um, so, uh, right, that's exactly what we do, right? So we discretize our y of t in theta, um, which gives us our extended variable state space uh, four. Clearly, that's a, a typo. It's not the number four. It's spent too much time in Scotland already. Four, yeah, four, for our analysis. Um, so here's uh, right how we're going to write down our. Uh, approximate affine representation. Um, sometimes it will be convenient to think about it as this, right? The, the, the WH, our fractional Brownian motion. Uh, so we put a hat on it. Um, sometimes, since we're going to be making lots of Taylor expansions and, and, and conditioning, it'll be more convenient to be able to write it in terms of the sort of underlying extended variables Y or R, R, O, U processes. Um, and the, the sort of the crux here is that we, we think about our weak error, right, which is this expected value of this minus this. Um, we're here, this is our left function of our left point, um, left point rule uh, using the fractional Brownian motion. Uh, we can split it, right, into these parts. Um, this uh, aff approximate affine representation tells us, right, that is the NL, right, the number of quadrature points and the L, the, the region that we're sort of truncating our infinite integral over, right, um, that is, as these get big, right, uh, this is where we're going to see the rate um, because these parts are going to, to vanish. So, right, essentially we're able to look on uh, here's our x and here's our x hat, our left point rule, uh, using this affine, uh, this approximate affine representation. And so we're going to consider this term here um, to extract the rate in delta t. So 
Um, so what do we do? Uh, we, we look on our uh, extended variable system by right, substituting this approximate affine representation into our underlying x. And when we do that, we write down x hat. And now together with x hat, we consider these underlying uh, OU processes y uh, together, right? This gives us a dynamics in, in NL plus one dimensions, right? And now we look on the Euler discretization, right? So this left point rule uh, for this dynamics, Z. Um, okay, uh, I mean, this is uh, probably don't need to beat a dead horse, right? So we, we I mean, this uh, Euler discretization right here, I write it using just the interpolant Right, so this here is just a way of writing this so I can write down things like uh, uh, dx bar um, without having uh, people upset, right? Um, so, I mean, this is literally just uh, taking the left hand, uh, left hand point um, for, for our, our time discretization uh, interval. Um, our y's, right, can be sampled exactly because, I mean, this is just some, I mean, joint, um, I mean, this is a joint, I mean, we can write this down uh, jointly and we know precisely what is the covariance. Um, so the, the idea, right, is then that we write, uh, we you know, formulate the Kolmogorov backward equations, right, and we, we, you know, for some smooth bounded payoff, right, we consider um, the value function uh, u, right, so this would be the expected value of our, our payoff on, on this extended ZT dynamics. Um, was that a question? Yeah, I, I have one, oh. but I'm waiting for my yeah. moment. Um, what's, what's, <laughs> the, yeah. what's the relationship between y1, yNL, and uh, w? S. So, w S. Right. So so these are um so so these Ys, right? Uh sorry if maybe I left out, right? So these these Ys are when I write Y L, uh, I mean Y of theta L, right? So I replace this with some quadrature. So we're going to be summing up the D thetas. So we, we sort of have a, you know, we approximate our, our theta um, by breaking it up, theta one, theta two, right? Uh, so they're, we all, they're, all measurable theta. they're all measurable with respect to the same WS, I guess. Yes, yeah, oh yes, yes. Um, so uh, that, that answer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, and so uh, once we have our, our extended variable system, right, this guy, um, we can uh, think then about writing down um, an expression for the weak error, right, in terms of these uh, value functions, right? So, right, in particular, we do the I mean, this isn't like, uh, uh, this is sort of the things I guess that you'd want to do, right? So you write down, right, a representation for the weak error as a telescoping sequence of, of these local errors, right? So here I is the, the index going over the, the um, time discretization. Um, so we write this error as a, a telescoping sequence in the, in the value function. Uh, this is going to be a bit fast, right? But essentially the important thing here is that, right, we, we can look at just, you know, any one of these, right? And using the Kolmogorov backward equation, we're able to express this local weak error um, using the Kolmogorov backward equation, right? And, and there what pops out is some increment of our approximate affine representation um, with, uh, against some uh, derivatives of the value function. 
Okay, and it's the same thing here. It's some increment here. It's a different power, right? So here we have some squares here. It's just the increment um, and different derivatives. Um, these parts uh, we can work out sort of by just you know, directly computing the fluxes. And when one does that, right, uh, you see here and here, uh, right, this, this, these expressions, right, come about just by directly computing, right? Uh, and the thing to, to, to look at and say, ah, okay, uh, I see, see what could happen here now. Um, you see we have the payoff and we have already two derivatives of it. Um, so if it is the case that right, phi is a quadratic polynomial, um, if we need to take any more derivatives of it, uh, it's going to vanish, right? Um, so, so in particular, I said we'd have Taylor expansions and the conditioning arguments. So where do, where do these um, Taylor expansions come in? Um, so in particular, uh, these parts, yes, uh, are where we're going to insert some Taylor expansions. And um, so when we do have a quadratic phi, uh, it's very simple because um, only, I mean, there is no more higher order terms in the Taylor expansion. So, I mean, one simply computes this to get um, the rate in delta T. Um, for general phi, uh, things get much more complicated. We have to do the Taylor expansions, uh, but we'll come to that. Um, all right. Um, so then, right, the idea is uh, that we have this, I mean, so, so we have this for, for our local weak error, right? We've expressed it using the Kolmogorov backward equation, uh, and then um, directly computing the fluxes. Uh, you might see on some slides, I realized when I was going back that uh, this in the paper and, and on subsequent slides, right, that was referring to it as J for the first integral and J tilde for this, for this guy. Um, so, uh, so, so what happens, right? Now we're just thinking about our local weak error. Um, so we want to tailor expand uh, those new and the new tilde that's appearing in our local weak error at uh, ZTI and then apply a conditioning argument. So uh, sort of the important thing to realize is that uh, this Z bar, right? So this Euler scheme is, is linear with respect to the increments over TI and S, TI to S. Um, essentially, right, look, we take for, for the increments, right? I mean, you wind up with this sort of vector where here we've written out um, all the increments. Remember, these are just our OU processes. And this is the, uh, the, the, the Brownian motion that we started with. Um, uh, so our, our Taylor expansion of nu um, at uh, TI is going to look like this, right? So you see we have here, um, higher derivatives of nu. And remember nu is depending on this payoff phi already having two derivatives of it. Um, so higher order derivatives. Um, if phi is, is general phi, okay, we have to put up with this. Uh, if it's uh, already quadratic, then um, th th these terms won't be contributing anything to the rate. Um, so in particular, this Taylor expansion, we make it up to some K, okay? Uh, and here we've just written down um, sort of the, the parts that are coming from here, what powers they get raised to. Um, importantly, right, these uh, new and the derivatives, right, were deterministic functions of um, uh, these FTI measurable random variables, CTI. Uh, so the, the new is FTI measurable, right? So this is where the conditioning will come in. So if we, if we plug these in, and here I just look at the first term, you see we get things that look like this, right? So we have um, 
this new expression times this conditional expectation. Um, here we have these middle terms, right? We get to, again, derivatives of new times um, some left-hand points uh, for our uh, approximate affine representation. And then we have, again, a conditional expectation that involves increments. And then we have a remainder part. Um, so the terms that are going to be contributing right to the rate in delta t are only these conditional expectations right, that have increments delta t in them. Right? These other parts will be contributing to the constant, but they won't be contributing to the rate. Uh, hopefully that makes sense, right? So right, after isolating the order in delta t using these expansions, right, the, the key will be to show that the, the expansion coefficients, right, because they depend on these extended state space variables, y of t that depend on the thetas, um, that these are controlled with respect to the theta L, right? So we're going to have lots of sums over theta Ls. And we, even though they, they might not contribute to the delta T, we have to make sure that these are all converging. Um, so hopefully I can give some sense of how this works. Uh, okay, we're at 48. So I have to accelerate. <laughs> Um, all right, so so the, the you know if we have finite expansions with the quadratic payoffs, right? Hopefully, it doesn't need much convincing, right? The higher order derivatives in in new and new tilde in the expansion vanish, right? And we get um, just that our local weak error uh, is looking like this. Okay, uh, this term that has just the increment of the w hat uh, is going to be zero. Um, now this, right, here comes the joy of, of having this extended variable system, right? Where you're able to sort of work directly with the extended variables. What, what I say joy, but maybe it's also a pain because um, it's a lot, of, a lot of headaches, a lot of bookkeeping, right? But anyway, the joy of working directly with these increments of the extended variables, right, is that we can um, make an explicit calculation, right? Um, so in particular, right, you see that we have sums here over the theta, theta L, theta K. Um, here's the term that's going to be contributing to the rate, right? And delta T is the only term that involves an S minus TI. Um, and here is some random part, um, right? I'm oh, sorry, it comes in here, right? In, inside the expected value, it's inside the integral. So this is the part that's giving delta T. And here are some things that involve the theta k, theta l, we'll need to make sure that they're uh, summable, um, <clears throat> that this sum is in fact convergent. Uh, so, so then for this first term, right, um, uh, maybe there should be a, a two somewhere else, not here, but okay, up, up to the constants, right? Uh, we find, um, it, right, if we look here, um, right, so on this uh, integral, right, one, one can use um, a Lipschitz argument um, to, to, right, so we'd look at a function uh, g of s, which is this, and we look at g of s minus g of zero, right, and uh, you can compute the Lipschitz constant, which here is just theta p plus theta p theta pl plus theta pk um, and then uh, one can sum this um, exactly right so then here uh, one gets uh, a delta t squared right from this term uh, and one needs to work uh, to get uh, make sure this is is convergent okay um, importantly i just pointed out right because this is for our local weak error Right? We still have to sum it up over TIs. Um, importantly here, uh, recall that this P that was coming from the sort of change of variables in the beginning was, it was bigger than two. Um, so when we sum up over TI, this will still be okay. Um, but then of course, when we sum up over the TI, in the end, we'll lose a delta T. 
um, which is precisely where uh, we get uh, weak rate one for quadratic payoffs, right? So that's uh, what I said, right? So we just return to our telescoping representation of the weak error, right? We, we use that estimate that we just came, uh, that we just got for uh, these the integrals like this, right? Uh, we have to then sum up uh, over the i's. So we lose a delta t, um, but um, we, we get that the weak rate for you know, quadratic payoffs when uh, the psi is the identity function is exactly rate one. Now, uh, when we want to go to general payoffs, right, these higher order terms in our Taylor expansion uh, do not vanish. Uh, and in fact, uh, to, to, to deal with um, the YKs, uh, we, we actually look on further expanding uh, the terms uh, new. Uh, so, 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 so the remaining terms, um, since, since the new are sort of, uh, I mean, the, the, these exist too, and, 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 and uh, we further Taylor expand um, in, in a Taylor series of this F at zero. Uh, so we wind up with lots of terms uh, that are like this in the expansion and derivatives. Um, we write down some auxiliary function uh, that's a function of the random uh, variables, uh, sorry, processes yk, yl, for example. And then we make a Taylor expansion of this at, oops, what on earth happened? Mayday. Oh, there we go. <laughs> sorry, I don't know what that was about. Um, so uh, we, we, we use uh, similar methods, right, to estimate uh, and Unfortunately, right, uh, we, we only obtain um, for each of our local weak error estimates, basically all these J terms, um, delta T to the H plus three halves. And so then essentially when you sum up over I, you get delta T H plus one half um, for the rate. Um, uh, so I guess I did judge it right. I didn't think I would have so much time uh, to go through, uh, but uh, let me finish real quickly. Uh, so, I mean, currently, right, we're working on extending uh, this to when we have these nonlinear psi. Um, you can see if we look on sort of these local weak error estimates right here, there should be some size. Uh, these fluxes suddenly uh, become much more complicated, right? Because they have lots of, I mean, there's lots more terms. Um, again, what happened? Uh, okay, to be careful touching things. Um, uh, but we don't doubt sort of that this uh, method of proving uh, these things uh, will extend uh, to the nonlinear psi. Um, so just a few key points, right, is that, right, for this left point uh, scheme, right, the Euler scheme, the weak rate is H plus a half uh, for general payoffs, um, but we find rate one for quadratic payoffs. Uh, the proof uh, relies on Taylor expansions and an affine Markovian representation for the underlying from these asymptotic expansions, right? It's nice, I think, because you can observe the mechanism behind these different rates, right? So that you get rate one for quadratic payoffs, it kind of pops out at you. Uh, um, we're currently uh, working to extend this to the nonlinear psi. Um, so that was uh, all I had uh, to share with you. Uh, thank you for listening. People ask lots of questions, but I'm happy to try and answer anything else.